This evening, I am very, very excited to welcome a very special guest, a man who's done huge amounts of research of his own, huge amounts of work to advance our knowledge of our culture and to inspire many others, some of whom I'm sure are watching this evening, making his Arboricultural Association Wednesday webinar debut, and in fact, it turns out, his webinar debut, Dr. David Lonsdale. David, over to you. Well, thank you very much, John, and uh, good evening to everyone. And uh, I hope that uh, my, as it's my debut, I won't make too many mistakes. But anyway, I understand that um, many of you are attending from outside the UK, so a special welcome to you as well. I'm going to go on my share screen on PowerPoint now, if that's fine, okay, John? Yeah, that's fine, you go for it. I shall tell you when it's all up and working. For those people who always like to ask, we've got 750 people in at the moment. I think somewhere up on that top bar will have, um, I can't see it because I've got a little option, slideshow, I think, the one in the middle. Yeah, now the, yeah, the trouble is, at the moment, I have to say that uh, some of the Zoom uh, icons are hiding the top of my PowerPoint screen. <laughs> so I just need to try and <clears throat> see if I can find the PowerPoint menu, which has disappeared <laughs> off the top of my screen. So That's um, all right. Uh, uh, if you, uh, are, the, are the Zoom options, uh, all the yeah, Zoom options have little gone to the top, you can all gone to the top of the, they're hiding, the Zoom options have all gone to the top. And you can also press F5 on the keyboard and that will, um, that will should it do it for you. Uh, okay. Well, well done, Andrew. Okay. It's all working now, David, over to you. Okay. The only other thing, can, can I get rid of my own image and yours? And because uh, I do need to look at my slides as I go through. And I've got... I think up, if you put your cursor over where you can see uh, our images, the yes. top left, there's a, a flat line which says well, hide I'm, thumbnail I'm, video. I've done that. That's fine. Thank you very much. Perfect. No I problem. Think I think we're on the way then. Marvellous. Um, a few questions still worth asking, and I'm hoping that this doesn't hark back too many years or indeed decades, but um, I think, as John said, I worked for many years at uh, uh, Alice Holt Research Station, and uh, it's a bit of a re retrospective for me in some respects. Um, I just hope it doesn't seem too out of date, but I, I put the um, title, a few questions still worth asking, because I really think they are. So I'm going to start off just by summarizing those questions. And I have to say one thing that really confused me and made it difficult for me to understand compartmentalization was that there was um, an article written by Walter Shortle. And I'm sure you've all heard of Alex Shigo, who sadly died um, quite a number of years ago, but Walter Shortle was one of Alex's main colleagues in the USA. And I, I did meet Walter when I went over to see them. But he wrote an article which rather confused me. And that was, I uh, think, in the late 70s or about 1980, so it was a long time ago. But he said that basically the heart rot concept, which goes back to the late 19th century, was somehow flawed. And uh, he presented code it or compartmentalization of decaying trees as the replacement for heart rot. So that's perhaps the key question I'm going to look at this evening. Now, as you can see from the blurb which was sent out, there are a few other questions which I'm going to look at as well. <clears throat> One of those is, are decay fungi ever parasitic or pathogenic? And I'll go into a bit more detail, explain what I mean by that. And I'm sure many of you now know that uh, we use this word dysfunction quite a lot. And um, <clears throat> so I'm going to look a little bit at the uh, why the D in the code it is now often replaced by dysfunctional damage rather than decay. And something which uh, I'm, I'm honestly not sure, perhaps some of you can tell me when we get to question time, but I'm not really sure how much 
wound paints are ever used these days, but uh, when the story was that they're pretty useless, I think a lot of practitioners were really pleased because it was quite a job lugging paint cans, which were very messy, and you get paint over your nice overalls, and the message was you don't need to use them, they're no good. But we'll have to revisit that question. And finally, something which we did look at also at Alice Holt Research Station was the use of biocontrol, biological control agents. So I'm going to try and go through those questions one by one. And um, I want to start off, though, by saying decay is a very natural process in the life of a tree. And it's expressed in a very negative way in a lot of the literature and in talks. And you can understand this in a sense. I mean, if you were a farmer and you were growing potatoes or carrots or onions and they decayed, well, that really um, would be a pretty negative loss. You know, you don't want to be losing income through decay. But as in um, farming, of course, forestry is there to produce a product. And the product is timber and other tree related materials. And again, decay might be pretty bad news. But as far as the tree is concerned, no one really told the tree that decay is a bad thing. Uh, if it happens too quickly, it might shorten the life of the tree, though. So we can look a bit at that. But uh, let's not be too negative about it. And uh, not only do trees live with decay, often for centuries, but decay processes uh, release nutrients, which can be then reused by the tree, and they provide habitat for a myriad of species. And there's even a human being in this particular case. And uh, <laughs> so let's look at the next slide. You still call them slides. And uh, this one was sent to me just the other day, actually, kindly by, um, his name disappeared off the edge of the, uh, the, the, um, the text box, Chris Knappman. And um, this is a really nice crab apple tree that's got what we call functional units and also one dead section. So the tree's still standing. Uh, well, at least it was when you took the photograph. There have been some pretty severe gales since then, so let's hope it's still there. And um, Here's a famous, this was taken quite a few years ago. This tree, unfortunately, is still alive, I believe. It's um, deteriorated since the photo was taken, but it shows what we call functional units, where the tree has divided itself into a number of almost individual discrete trees. And the center is completely rotted away by a heart rot fungus, or number of heart rot fungi. And, um, I just want to emphasize really that trees do live and they live very successfully with decay. Just a quick look at this little diagram I, I used in an article I wrote a few years ago. Um, there's a single tree which has got the branches, the foliage producing the, uh, the sugars and the starch that feed the growth of the tree. The main stem that conducts water up and sugars downwards towards the ground. And of course, the root system, which absorbs the water and minerals. And indeed, the root system is fed by the sugars from the crown of the tree. So those three components, the foliage, the connecting stem and branch, and the roots, those are the three main components. And if you look at many what we call veteran trees, which are either truly ancient or they've got ancient characteristics, they've often divided themselves into a number of these autonomous units. Let's, I'll go back just to remind you, each of those columns you can see is part of a semi-autonomous unit connecting branches with the root system. Right, so the heart rock concept, and I must say I really struggled over this. It, it wasn't a huge intellectual uh, exercise, but I knew what heart rot was, but I couldn't really understand why this article by Walter Shortle was saying it was flawed. And um, 
bear in mind that uh, heart rot is often confined mainly to the heartwood or rightwood. Well, one of the stories that I thought I was getting out of Walter Shortle's article, but I'm still not really sure. One of the stories was, uh, what did the heart rot um, proponents back in the 19th and early 20th century, what did they think about sapwood? And every bit of information I managed to get on that indicated that they believed that sapwood was a tissue that had natural resistance against decay. The thing that they had not done was to go into the details which come under the heading of compartmentalization of decay. But they somehow just seem to know or assume that sapwood had resistance. It was a living tissue. I'm not sure they fully understand, uh, uh, understood the, um, the details of the physiology of sapwood. But I think they knew that back, even back in the 19th century, that it was a tissue that could react against um, injury and against fungal ingress. And the reason that they developed the heart rot concept was that they understood the heart wood or the central wood of the tree was non-living. It had been living once, but now it was no longer living. And it could not react in the same way as sap wood. And that it could serve as an entry point for decay fungi into the tree. So let's look at processes which may influence the ability of a fungus to exploit woody tissue once it's got in through, say, a, a wound. And um, the tree's got both passive and active defenses. And I'm going to look, talk about the difference between those a little bit later on. But um, just to mention that quite briefly now, for example, the high moisture content and low content of free oxygen is a passive defense in wood. And if wood becomes more aerated because of injury, that may cause drying out, partial drying out, and also increased um, oxygen, which supplies decay fungi with one of the things they need. Actually, decay fungi are pretty good at living in very low oxygen conditions, but they do need some oxygen. So wounding not only lets the fungus get into the tree, it also aerates the wood and makes it more suitable for use by the fungus. Um, some fungi, and I'm going to address the question of whether they're really pathogens, but active pathogenesis certainly does occur. And I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And a very interesting thing, which uh, I was amongst a number of people looked at a few years ago, latent colonization, when the fungus is already there in the healthy wood, and it's just waiting for the opportunity to develop when conditions become more suitable. Uh, here's an example where someone uh, has made the conditions more suitable, I'm afraid. The householder there probably wanted to get a better view um, across the road and uh, he's had all these uh, large branches cut off the tree um, quite close, almost not quite flush cuts, but they're very close to the main stem, exposing central wood which in this case, as it's a beech tree, not a true heartwood, but it's um, ripe wood, as we call it, which is just sap wood that has gradually aged. And um, trees like beech, and I think pretty well all the maples, ma many other species of tree, in the center, they don't have true heartwood, they have what we call ripe wood. And that is usually highly susceptible to decay once it's exposed by a wound. And if you get multiple wounds, you may end up with something like this. This is a picture. I'm afraid it's um, not quite sure what you can see on your screens, but it's uh, cut a little bit off the top of my slide on this particular screen now. But this is the fungus Cereoporus squamosus. And, the name Cereoporus is actually missing from my screen at the moment, I'm afraid. 
That's what we I, I used to call this proliferous squamosis. And it's a fungus which um, typically it will occupy a relatively small volume of wood in the immediate vicinity of a wound, a wound that exposes either heartwood or ripe wood. And in this case, unfortunately, it's a bit like a, a somewhat later version of the one I just showed you there. Uh, but in this one that Roy Finch took a photograph, I don't know if you're out there, Roy, but uh, it's a nice example of um, where multiple pruning wounds have resulted in the coalescence of decay columns. There's also, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there are these strips of dead bark which have actually linked up the individual pruning wounds. So um, it's a pretty massive uh, colonization of the tree. And I think that tree, it was in a pretty dangerous condition. I believe Roy told me that had to be failed, unfortunately. So it was really not a very good thing to do to it to create all those sizable wounds exposing uh, ripe wood. The fungus, as I say, normally will occupy a, a, a small area around one wound and it won't usually spread beyond that one wound, but you create, if you create a, a large number of wounds, particularly if they're quite close together, then you do, do get this uh, coalescence of the decay columns between each individual wound. Now here's a big old tree. Um, this is up in uh, Cheshire in, I must remember most of you are in the UK, but quite a few are not. So anyway, this is in uh, northwest of England and it's by a, a stately home um, and there's a, actually that's a moat <laughs> surrounding the building just behind the tree so it probably has rather restricted root development on the far side where you've got water but this tree has uh, got to the stage when the vast bulk of its wood is now non-living it's either heartwood and it's Quercus roba so it's got um, uh, quite a durable kind of heartwood so it's all non-living heartwood and also it got some layers of sapwood that have been uh, dying back in recent years. I think what's happened here is that there have been some big pruning wounds like the one, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, pruning wound like that and also some wounds further up near the top of the, the tree you can't see. And those have led to the development of columns of dysfunction. Remember we we're talking about columns of function. So you've got some functional bark and functional wood running up there and some functional bark, functional sapwood, but there's a great area of dysfunctional sapwood that's now, well, basically it's dead and dysfunctional. And of course, in the center of the tree, partly decaying heartwood. But the tree's still alive. It consists of a really thin shell of functional tissue divided into maybe three or four functional units where you see these individual branches, but the tree is still surviving pretty well. Um, now this tree actually, uh, I, I, I understand it blew down in a severe wind not very long after I took that picture, which was quite a while ago now. But again, central decay is surrounded by function, uh, by columns of functional sapwood and bark. And um, you can see these columns again, these are parts of discrete semi-autonomous functional unit, units linking up root system with the crown of the tree. Uh, so the tree again, it's, it's has, uh, coexisted with decay fungi. Eventually, sadly, it did blow down, but uh, I don't know if it's still alive, but one thing to bear in mind that when trees do have a failure, they don't necessarily die. In many cases, part of the tree still survives. As I showed you in that picture at the be beginning where Chris Knappman had provided me with a, a crab apple photograph showing, well, 
it's a failure, but you'd need to tell the tree it was a failure because the tree's still alive. You or I might think it's a failure, but we're looking at it in a human context. And another example here, this is um, a um, sweet chestnut, a castanea. And again, we had this massive, dead, dysfunctional hulk of uh, heartwood with some sapwood on the outside that has died. But you've got these discrete columns, these discrete functional units, which are still very much alive. And the great thing about tree species like the castania and the quercus in the earlier picture is that they got this durable heartwood, which it does decay, but it decays slowly. So that often it can decay at about the same rate or maybe more slowly than the trees laying down new wood on the outside. And so coexistence can go on for a very long time. It is a bit more of a problem with something like, let's say, Fagus sylvatica, where the tree's central wood is ripe wood. It doesn't have that same high durability and it can decay more quickly. And I think that's why you do not see so many individuals of, say, Fagus sylvatica or some of the Acer species living to the same sort of immensely great age that you find with Castania, Fagus. Uh, taxus and some other genera. Now the active and passive defenses are affected by the aging process. Sapwood is defended by a high moisture content and of course it's a living tissue so it can react to injury by active defenses. Heartwood, as I just say in some species, is relative du relatively durable because it has these natural preservatives. And thus said, the non-durable heartwood or ripe wood of other species is not so resistant, therefore it will be easily, more easily colonized by decay fungi. And the following diagram just indicates that. So on the uh, left-hand side, the tree with a true heartwood species, uh, sorry, a tree species with a true heartwood, and the one on the left is a tree species with a ripe wood in the a core in the right in the center and ripe wood is the result of sapwood gradually aging so you've got recently formed sapwood on the outside but well, to give you an example um, i've looked at fagus sylvatica more than most other species and i found that if you look at sapwood of about the last 30 years pretty well all the original living cells are still living after about 30 years but from then on they gradually die and when you get to about 70 80 years they're mostly dead and anything older than that would be completely dead and uh, that older wood in the middle of a beech tree it, it, it can last a very long time if it does not get too much exposure to the air and too much aeration. I saw some 300 year old beech tree. Well, I know they were 300 years old because uh, they were planted in a, um, a, a deer park. It was part of a, a private property in the days when people spent a great deal of money on these things. And it's all, all been recorded in the history of that large property. And we knew they were 300 years old and there was hardly any decay in the center because I think it was because those trees had not received very many wounds that exposed this central ripe wood. And of course, in a, say a Quercus or Taxus, which has a durable heartwood, they live for a great length of time while this heartwood very gradually decays in a pretty benign way. And most of the fungi that do that will not move out into the sapwood. And so the sapwood is providing both mechanical support and it's a living tissue which is conducting water, nutrients, sugars. And so again, coexistence can go on for a long time. Some of the oldest 
trees which are of the kind we're looking here on the right hand side, uh, they have been managed as pollards. And one example in this country, of course, is Burnham Beaches to the west of London, where beech trees, Fagus, have been maintained as ancient, well, they're, they're now ancient, but they've been maintained throughout their lives as pollards. And that has enabled them to produce more functional units and they haven't uh, fallen apart from decay as perhaps you would get with a, a tree that hasn't been managed in that way. So factors that affect development of decay, as I've mentioned, I can't say this too many times, so I'll say it again. Functional sapwood is usually too moist, therefore too poorly aerated for active development of most decay fungi. But if the sapwood becomes damaged, it can become locally dysfunctional and then decay develops. Active defenses do defend sapwood against. So this is the thing that was confusing me a bit when I was trying to get to grips with Walter Shortle's article. Uh, he, does, he just did not seem to disagree about the fact that heartwood or ripe wood can be exposed to the air and it can become colonized. He did not really seem to disagree with the argument that sapwood has defenses, uh, including active defenses. So I thought, what really does he disagree with? And to this day, I can't find anything. All I can think is that he and the late Alex Shigo just felt that the heart rock concept, it just simply did not explain what they call compartmentalization. And I think that would be a fair comment, but it didn't purport to explain the details of compartmentalization. It just explained that if, it, if you expose heartwood or ripe wood, it can become decayed. So I don't think there was any real mystery. Maybe it's just that it was a way of promoting compartmentalization, but I think it could be promoted alongside the old heart rock concept rather than as a kind of replacement for it. We can discuss that. I welcome any questions on that. Um, now, a really important thing, which uh, Alex Shigo didn't make the first observation ever, and he was very freely, uh, freely admitting that, but it is usually the case that wood formed after a traumatic event remains largely functional, even if reaction zones within the pre-existing sapwood are breached by the fungus. And I'm going to come on to reaction zones in a minute. Finally, again, heart will remember it is relatively durable in some species, so it can't actively respond like sapwood because it's not living like sapwood, but it has this natural durability in some species of tree. So my second question, are decay fungi ever parasitic or pathogenic? And I think really part of the answer to this question is it's a bit of a human construct to say something is a parasite. And uh, looking at um, a lot of textbooks, including quite old textbooks, I think maybe if a fungus is seen to be growing on a living tree, it's assumed to be a parasite. In fact, it may just be living on the dead parts of the tree that are part of a living tree, but they are still nevertheless not living. Having said that, I think uh, there are definitely some fungi that have evolved in a manner which is perhaps uh, directed towards overcoming the defenses of the tree. And they include the formation of what we call reaction zones. And I'm going to show you a couple of pictures soon which show reaction zones. And a reaction zone is where the living sapwood lays down substances that either because of their chemistry or because of their uh, physical properties, they block off or um, otherwise prevent fungal development. 
Uh, there are some fungi that can actually penetrate reaction zones. The ones that can't tend to be more restricted to wood that is already physiologically dysfunctional. So that's one of the dividing things between fungi that really can get through, punch their way through the defenses of the tree and the ones that can't. Um, and when we look at the defensive substances, these natural preservatives in durable kinds of heartwood, in, for example, Quercus, Taxus, Castania, uh, there are some fungi that can break, either break down those substances or tolerate them. Um, and they tend to be pretty slowly growing. Uh, they still perhaps slow down the fungus, even though the fungus can tolerate them or break them down. But it does mean that it does enable some of these tree species to live for hundreds of years in happy coexistence with the fungus. Now, there are other fungi which I, I sometimes called them the ram raiders. I think there was a spate of robberies in London and Manchester and other cities where these very daring thieves would drive a car through the front window of a jewelry shop and make off with the goodies. And they were called ram raiders. I don't know if that term is still used much, but uh, uh, one of those is the silver leaf fungus, Chondrosterium purpureum. And a, a, a correct term for them is fresh wound pathogens. They grow really quickly through injured sapwood. They can rapidly colonize that tissue and they just do that before the host even has a chance to defend itself. Now, this is a really interesting fungus in a notus hispidus. And um, one of the things it uh, does on ash, in fact, I've got two different pictures of this. Uh, sorry, the same picture will appear again in my presentation. This first one shows this um, arrowed dark zone of tissue here. And that I believe is a reaction zone that was laid down where the sapwood was trying to wall off the fungus from moving out into younger sapwood, but the fungus has actually moved. So I'll just stay with that one. The fungus has actually moved through the reaction zone. And uh, what you often see are what we call relic or relic reaction zones which have been in some cases actually faded away they're usually dark colored reaction zones are usually a brown or reddish brown or in the case of uh, maples acer species they're often greenish in color but they tend to get bleached chemically bleached by the fungus as it degrades them i, I don't think this fungus bleaches them but uh, anyway it seems to have punched its way through the react so it's now occupied all this sapwood right the way out to the outside of the, uh, the bark there and something rather similar here this is i think this is a tilia species and again, this is this is one's a Ganoderma rather than um, the in, a, in the notice you have in the last slide. And um, this is a I think this may actually have been a barrier zone at one stage, but it's probably a barrier zone combined with a reaction. This fairly broad dark zone around here on the north eastern corner, and I've arrowed it there. I hope you can see the main arrow. That has been breached by the fungus. It's, it's punched its way through. And Francis Schwarzer, who worked with me some years ago, now a professor in the uh, EMPA Institute in Switzerland, uh, he and his co-workers found that some Ganoderma species, I mean, certainly Ganoderma um, australi, can punch their way through reaction zones. So I think that does suggest if you don't mind using the term pathogenic or parasitic, the fungus has at least developed a means of overcoming the defenses, the active defenses of the host tree. So you could say that is somewhat evidence of parasitism 
or even pathogenesis if it means it's loss of living tissue that causes the health of the tree to deteriorate. And I've certainly seen trees with Ganoderma australe that have died. And I think it's because it's occupied a lot of the sapwood in the root system. Uh, something I ought to mention at this stage, um, I haven't really got any slides that illustrate this, but I think when decay fungi do act like pathogens or parasites, one of those situations is where you have a new combination of a fungus species and a host species. And I always remember I paid a visit to a, a public park on a meeting we went to in Leeds in the north of England. And we saw a number, I think certainly two um, monkey puzzles, um, Araucaria araucana, and they had died, they quite recently died, and they had Ganoderma fruiting at the base. And I think it was just that this species of tree, which comes from, of course, South America, had come into contact with a European species of Ganoderma, uh, which it had not co-evolved with. Now, co-evolution is a really important word, because if species co-evolve, co uh, so the tree co-evolves with a particular decay fungus, they often end up with quite a harmonious existence that uh, there may be advantages even to both partners. But when you get a new combination produced by human beings moving a tree species from one continent to another, or moving a fungus from one continent to another, then it's then you're more likely to get these more aggressive situations where there really is some sort of pathogenesis or parasitism. Now, um, some things to think about. Um, even if a fungus is um, colonizing only the non-living central wood, when you read textbooks and the textbook says this fungus is parasitic, bear in mind it might just simply mean it's growing, we can see a fruit body of the fungus on a living tree, even if that fungus is parasitized, not even parasitizing, it may just be growing as a saprotroph on dead tissue in the middle of the tree. Now, toxin production, I don't think I mentioned this so far, but it really is a sort of strong indication that a fungus that produces a toxin is really a parasite or a pathogen because that does give it the ability to overcome resistance of sapwood or maybe to suppress the resistance. And I just put this slide up just to illustrate that I, there's a lot of literature and I'm not very well up to date with some of this, but here's one about three years ago uh, where these authors are talking about these things called metabolites, secondary metabolites of the xylem. And there's a whole range of toxins which the tree produces to defend itself against the fungus. So it's a sort of warfare in a way. We talk about coevolution and uh, coexistence, but that is achieved because both the tree and the fungus in a sort of partial warfare, one's producing defenses and attack mechanisms. The word attack is one I don't like using now, but Ted Green has always told me to use the word colonization. So I'll, I'll say colonization mechanisms. And of course, if you want, if you're a fungus and you want to colonize a tree and the tree doesn't want you to, <laughs> put it in a rather anthropomorphic sense, let's say the tree doesn't really want to be overwhelmed by the fungus, then it's only reasonable to expect the tree to have defenses and the fungus to have some um, colonization mechanisms. It doesn't mean it's out and out warfare, but it means there's a balance, often a really quite happy balance between the two. But these defenses do exist and these colonization processes do exist. And that's why when you get a new combination of different species of fungus and tree, it often all goes horribly wrong. 
and you get trees being overwhelmed by the fungus and dying quite quickly. So there's a lot of literature out there. Um, and it's a bit out of date now, but uh, about 30 years ago, it was a very good review of the information that was available even then on tree defenses. And that was by the late Ray Pierce, very, very sad. He died in his late 40s. It was a dear colleague of mine. Um, and he, um, he was very expert in looking at the chemical warfare, if you can use that word, that is involved between trees and fungi. Let's go and look at a few examples. And um, the, this one is at one extreme end of the spectrum, really. This uh, Didaliopsis confagosa, I think there's an English name for it, but I think is the blushing bracket. And I don't think I've ever seen that growing on actual living tissue. It does grow on living trees, but it's on already dead branches and stems on those living trees. So that's at the end of the spectrum of fungi that I'm pretty sure do not have any parasitic or pathogenic ability. Uh, Later porous sulfureus, the uh, in English chicken of the woods, a heart rot fungus. It can grow either in the durable heartwood of species like uh, Quercus species, Taxa species, um, Robinia is another of its favorite hosts. So it does occur both on broadleaved and coniferous hosts. But it also occurs in trees that do not have a durable heartwood when the central wood is either ripe wood or it's a heartwood that's not very durable, as in the case of uh, Salix species, occasionally also on Fagus. So quite a wide host range, but the thing that does specialize it is its ability to tolerate the durable heartwood that's got these natural preservatives that you find in uh, uh, Quercus and Fa uh, Quercus and Taxus, for example. Another fungus that grows very slowly, the beefsteak fungus, Fistulina hepatica. It grows so slowly that often the tree is laying down more healthy sapwood on the outside than is being degraded in the heartwood on the inside. But here's an example, heterobacillinosum, or used to be called fomizinosis. This fungus produces toxins. There's been a lot, a lot of research on this, and those toxins help to overcome the resistance of the tree against decay fungi. And in some species, in Pinus, for example, it can actually even kill the entire tree. So I think it'd be difficult to argue that the fungus is not pathogenic or parasitic, but it may be that it's a spruce strain of the fungus that's causing the death of a Pinus host because you get different strains on different genera of conifer. So uh, when you start looking in more detail, uh, you can find examples of coexistence that do still exist, even if it looks like straightforward pathogenesis. Uh, coming back to this really interesting fungus, Inonotus hispidus. Uh, here it is fruiting on fraxinus, on ash stem. Uh, you've seen this picture before, but what I want to uh, look at this time is what's going on the outside of the tree because what this fungus can do is to kill the uh, cambial tissue just around the edge of the area where it is effectively maintaining itself. If the fungus didn't maintain itself by continually killing the newly formed sapwood and, and the cambium just around here on the outside. If it didn't do that, the tree would cover that wound over, the fungus would be locked up inside the tree and it would not then be able to spread further into younger wood. So that's really quite uh, an interesting thing it does. Uh, Fungi which do that, they form a canker on the outside of the tree as well as decay on the inside. And uh, those are known as canker rot fungi because they're producing a canker and a rot. So here's another fungus which is well known as a pathogen, 
because it can kill root tissue, the good old honey fungus, Armillaria melia. This one I showed you before, another tree, Seriopora squamosus. I'm fairly sure that actually is not really pathogenic or parasitic. But remember, I did show you the picture, one of Roy, Roy Finch's pictures, showing that it overwhelmed a tree that had been affected by multiple wounding, by pruning wounds. So even a fungus which normally remains uh, localized and doesn't have much, if any, ability to parasitize a tree, it can almost become like a parasite if you massively damage the tree. Now this one, Griffula frondosa, it occurs at the base of uh, mostly Quercus, and it does produce this very extensive white rot in the base of the tree. Uh, I think this is a tree that failed and then it was sawn off at the base and that, that exposed the um, white rot. So the only part of it that wasn't colonized by the fungus is these bits, that, if you can see my cursor, these areas at the top on the buttresses of the tree, they've gone dark because of mold growth that occurred before the photograph was taken. But it's only quite a small part of the tree that was left still functional, and it wasn't enough to hold the tree up in a high wind. And this, this fungus, you can see here this, uh, this reaction zone, this very dark zone, where the tree was trying to prevent the fungus moving further. But um, it, does a, it does seem that when fungi are in the root system, they seem to be able to bypass some of the natural defenses of the tree and extend, become, well, become more extensive than if they're just growing in the above ground part of the tree. So when I said that generally a fungus remains confined to the wood that was present at the time of wounding, that is certainly true of above ground decay, but it's probably not true generally of decay that's going on below ground. And this fungus is probably quite a good example of that. Another fungus which we get on Quercus, uh, Emnotus dryadeus, um, this does not seem to have quite the same ability to move into new tissue. It probably does have some ability to go into new sapwood, but often the tree and the fungus coexist very happily. And there's an example where uh, the fungus has rotted away the center of the tree. You can see right through the tree there, and it's still standing, it's still healthy, and pretty well coexisting. So yes, there may be some degree of parasitism, but it's something that the tree can live happily with. But this fungus, particularly frequent on phagus, but not only on, it's often found in other hosts as well, it is rather thought of as a bit of bad news for the tree. And it's, we've certainly got examples of phagus, beech trees, which have survived and coexisted for many years with this fungus. And even the fungus has died out eventually and the trees carried on growing. But there are other examples where the trees either died while still standing or it's blown over in a high wind. So it, with regard to safety assessment, hazard assessment, uh, there's no substitute for assessing the individual tree thoroughly. You shouldn't make assumptions, but uh, certainly this particular fungus has a bit of a track record that it does sometimes kill beech trees and sometimes it causes them to fail, but they can coexist. It's even been suggested there may be different strains of the fungus, some of them being more pathogenic than others, but that's a topic for new research. And this is perhaps one of the most benign fungi that occur at the bases of trees, uh, Sphelia sclerosa. I've got a feeling it might have changed its name, so I'm sorry if I'm not, not up to date on that. But um, it tends to cause hollowing at the base of the tree, but I don't think I've ever seen a tree that's failed with this fungus. I'm sure one of you will tell me you have, but uh, 
Uh, I haven't. I think it's got a pretty good track record of coexisting with the tree. And dysfunction versus decay. Well, the thing that really sticks in my memory, I'm afraid I have to say it's 40 years ago now, so I'm giving my age away, but uh, this paper by Lynn Boddy and uh, Alan Rayner was, I think it was a bit of a retaliation against the CODIT model. And I actually discussed this with Alan Rayner afterwards, and he, admit that, he admitted that he and Lynn Boddy went over the top a little bit, arguing against CODIT. And um, I think there's no doubt that uh, trees do have active defences in their sapwood. This paper by Boddy and Rayner focused not on the active defences, it focused on the passive defence, which was the role of moisture content. And they presented really very good evidence that a lot of what we see in compartmentalization is really passive defense where you have functional sapwood that is fully intact has a high moisture content it is therefore poorly aerated and is not a good not a good environment for decay and i i think it's a really useful paper but it probably went over the top to some extent by not giving due credit to the work that has been done on active defense and production of reaction zones. But it's an important paper. So that's all I wanted to say about whether it's a dysfunction or decay or um, damage. You can use whatever you word, ever word you like for the D in CODIT. And uh, I think CODIT really was a useful concept. But uh, you know, it, it wasn't as though nobody had ever seen trees with distinct geometrical patterns of decay in them before. So it was rather explaining things that people had seen without really understanding it. So it did help understanding and it continues to do so to this day. A bit about wound paints, are they really useful? And things that we used to find when we were doing research on this, loss of adhesion, flaking and peeling, and something that was not realized when we started this work at Alice Holt Research Station many years ago, sapwood already contains fungi in a latent state, so the paint really cannot keep a wound sterile. And um, so here's an example, this fungus, Biscognioxia nomularia, it is commonly present as a latent colonizer of sapwood. It's already there. So if you paint a wound, put a wound paint on a wound, you're actually uh, putting something on wood that is already colonized. And this was really very much one of the things that emerged during the research that was done at Alice Holt before I started. And my colleague, Peter Mercer, who started work on that project, he did his work before we knew how common it was for sapwood to have these latent colonizers in it. Here's another example, King Alfred's cake, Stardinia concentrica, and commonly found fruiting on fraxinus, on, on ash. We know from research that uh, we've done at Alice Holt and uh, Cardiff University, that it is also present in many other trees. At least eight species of tree or shrub also contain this as a latent colonizer. So putting a wound paint on the outside of a wound does not stop what's already there being there. And these are decay fungi, they're not just there for any other reason, they will decay the wood when it becomes aerated. But since a big but, I truly think a highly durable wound paint might help to restrict de decay. And we did some work at this, it's a good many years ago now. Uh, we found that uh, this stuff called Isoflex, and I got some free samples from the manufacturer, it was marketed as a roof repair product. And it was just as good as a really nasty comic, a chemical, uh, a mercury-based 
wound sealants. Of course, in, in, it has to be said that the latter was eventually banned for health and safety reasons. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this isoflex, it was just as good as this mercury-based, highly toxic wound sealant. And something which we were really quite keen on at uh, Addis Holt Research Station was biocontrol. And um, my, my colleague, Peter Mercer, uh, developed this strain. It's not, it was not bioengineered. It's be really before there was much in the way of um, genetic engineering or gene um, editing. Gene editing hadn't been invented in those days, but it was just selection of a naturally occurring strain. And you might have thought it would get a um, fast track through the approval process. And some of the results that we got were really encouraging. It persisted in pruning wounds. It seemed to be highly effective, at least over the four-year trial. It doesn't need longer than four years. Um, but then came new pesticide regulations that indicated it was not going to be financially worth pursuing this because it would cost so much to register it that it would not be commercially viable. So I think it could be worthwhile, um, but I, I, I think the registration process is difficult. In some other European countries, though, they get around these things by registering product as plant health improvement. So I think perhaps in the UK, we need to be a little bit more clever about how we get through some of the regulatory processes when we know perfectly well we're dealing with a, an organism that's naturally present and is not really a threat uh, or health hazard, or not a health hazard to humans. And that's it. So thank you very much for attending and I'll be delighted to try and deal with any questions if someone steers me through the Q&A process. Thank you. Thank you very much. You took me by surprise there, David. I didn't know you were going to stop. And then I was I was flustered. It's all right. We're good now. That was wonderful, David. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, absolutely brilliant. We've had lots and lots and lots of questions, as you would imagine, from an audience which is still on 911. So... Um, that is quite remarkable. We records breaking everywhere. Um, right, loads of questions. We're not going to be able to get through all of them. Uh, but there's one here that I liked from Reg Harris, and I will ask Reg's question. Um, Reg is saying that old textbooks tell us that beach becomes liable to wind throw when its roots are colonized by Maripolis. But in the last few years, we've had a number of people suggesting that actually beach can live quite happily with Maripolis and can be re retained instead of being felled. What do you think about that, David? Beach and Maripolis. Is it as bad as we've been led to believe over the years? Well, I, I thought I'd already covered this. I did actually show a picture of Maripolis on beach. And I think I did mention that we do have cases where it looks as though either the tree and the fungus have coexisted pretty happily or in some cases the fungus has actually used up whatever it could in the in the in the center of the tree in the wood there and it's actually died out and the trees lived on very happily and i did actually mention it. i don't know if it came across properly but um so i think the answer is yes it certainly does happen that there's either um mutual toleration or the fungus eventually is uh, does, does itself out of a job. It's, but uh, no, when, when um, Francis Schwartz and colleagues were looking in more detail at what Maripolis does in a Vegas beech tree, uh, it, it, it does have quite subtle mechanisms. It, it does seem to have the capacity to overcome host resistance. What we don't know is there may be different strains. I think uh, Julian Forbes Laird has suggested uh, not at the top of his head that anyone might do, but there are different strains, pathogenic and non-pathogenic. And I think that would be well worth follow, following up. I don't think anyone's done the research though. So I think, uh, I must say, um, I, I've got the Q&A thing open in front of me. I couldn't actually see the question. It was a Reg Harris, was it? But 
Yes, I, I, sorry, once I'd asked it, I deleted it, but um, uh, no, it, then, no, then it disappeared. Fine, but no, I, I, so I hope I did actually cover it, but yes, there are examples. That's why I say it's really important not to condemn a tree just because it's got Maripolis, but to do a proper assessment. Brilliant, thank you, David. Um, another question, I, I was interested uh, to see you talking about wound paint, because again, I know wound paint used a few years ago, completely acknowledged that that's just what you do. Then it very much fell out of fashion. I've heard talk from some people about maybe it being used as a viable method again now. And I've seen uh, Zoltan's question. Uh, Zoltan's asking about, has there been any research on the difference between organic or synthetic wound paints? Because in Hungary, Zoltan's saying that wound paints are still being used. What What do you think more generally about wound paint? Is it something we should be going back to or have we dismissed that really in the past? A lot of research was done, but you've got to bear in mind, a lot of it goes back many years and uh, it, it goes back so far that it went back before we actually knew that fungi were already present in a latent state. So people imagined that they were sealing spores out of the tree, whereas the spores were already in the tree. Of course, if a wound paint's really effective, it could exclude spores of other fungi that really do need to come in from the outside rather than already being there. So if Zoltan was asking about uh, organic and non-organic, I'm sure that some of the products that have been studied are one or the other organic. Um, I mean, I think there was one called Lac Balsam, which I think was uh, derived from natural products, but you know, not entirely natural. Whereas something like, I think, Arbrex, that was uh, um, sort of a uh, bitumastic synthetic compound. Um, so I don't know what the answer is generally, but most of these things were found not to work very well. And of course, Alex Shigo was very keen to say, just don't bother with them. They, they can even make decay worse by retaining more moisture in wounds that otherwise would have got too dry for decay. Um, however, it's a quite a big however, I did say that if the sealant could prevent the wood becoming partly dried out and therefore more aerated, I think it would work. And we've got evidence. It was only a short term trial, but I did mention that we tried this isoflex, which coming back to Zoltan's specific question, isoflex is synthetic because it's polyurethane, um, which you might not like, but uh, it's got an additive coal tar constituent. The coal tar was added uh, just to slow down the uh, polymerization process to make it workable while you're brushing it in. And it was, as I say, really made for repair of the garage roofs. And uh, interesting it's... story. Yeah, I, I, I heard an interview on BBC Radio 4 with a manufacturer and he said he'd had this wonderful life. So I wrote to him said, to have a free sample and said, yeah, please go ahead. And he was really pleased with the results we've got, I think. But again, uh, registration of it would have been quite difficult. I think it could work, mm -hmm. even though it's a synthetic product. So yeah, either natural or synthetic products, if they really do prevent uh, the wood from drying out to a more optimal condition for the fungus, yes, I think they could work. Brilliant. And Arborex is the one that all the arborists complained about getting covered in sticky tar, wasn't That's it? That's the when one they, they were delighted to say we can go up our rope without shoving this bloody thing dangling and sloshing all over me. Yeah. <laughs> There's a couple of people in the chat as well saying beeswax for wound painting. I think beeswax could actually, I, I suspect it would not, obviously, be a very nice natural product. But you all, we all know that if furniture at home gets damp, any kind of polish or wax will tend to erode away. So um, I, mean, I have to say, if you look at the instructions on things like Arborex tins, they often say you should go back and reapply. But I never met anyone who went, actually went back to the tree. And re so there's a bit of an open question as if you did reapply it, whether it would work. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Fiona has asked if you are planning to update your book about the principles of tree hazard assessment and management. There was an intention, I think it was the Arbicultural Association was involved to do that, but uh, I think there was some stalling of the process over copyright and uh, because it was a um, stationary office publication. And uh, I think it just got totally stalled. Meanwhile, the years have gone by and I'm maybe getting too old to do it now. <laughs> I'm sure we can put you to work, uh, David. We'll find it, uh, we'll have a look at that. Um, so talking about some other of, of your older work, Kevin Frediani has said that you did some preliminary work about the optimal timing of pruning with regard to calendar months. And Kevin was wondering if uh, that had ever been followed up at all. It wasn't followed. I must admit, we only published a brief summary of that work. Um, I think we would need to do it over a longer period of time. I think it was just a couple of years. That, you know, when you're doing a field trial and you've got short term funding, <laughs> you can't really do these things for as long as they ought to go on for. Um, but yeah, there were big differences between different times of the year. And the differences were not all the same between species. So I think there's a lot of interesting stuff there. But I mean, one thing which has been very well sort of understood, and I, I think it still applies, is discovered back in the 1920s, to go back even further than some of my references. Um, back in the 20s, it was found, I think it was East Morning they did this, that um, in terms of silver leaf infection, chondrosteria, it was far better to uh, do wounding if you if you had to do pruning do it in the sum uh, from sort of midsummer um, but not the autumn not winter not spring because in the summer the tree's defenses are more active against an aggressive potentially aggressive pathogen like the silver leaf fungus chondrosterium thank you um but we've got loads of questions, so we're not going to be able to work through them all. But what we will do, everybody, is we'll make sure a list of all of the questions is sent to David uh, after the webinar so he can have a look at, at what you've said. Um, a question from Paul about bridge grafting. Paul's saying that bridge grafting is rarely carried out, but as a form of management in mature trees, could it be a long term insurance by presenting preserving functional wood? Are we underusing bridge grafting as a technique on mature trees? Yeah, I do know a few cases and um, it requires skills more than I've got. But uh, yeah, I think it could really play a part when, uh, for example, uh, a tree has been damaged in a way that has just lost that connectivity mm -hmm. and bridge grafting. And again, I mean, a bridge graft is acting rather like well these functional units that I was um, illustrating in making a connection between the root system and the crown or re-establishing a connection. Uh, obviously, it's expensive. It's something that you only do for a high value tree. But um, I think maybe it should be done more often if people have got the skills to do it, which I had. And of course, when you talk about um, functional units, uh, you're too modest to say it, but a lot of our audience will know those as Lonsdale columns, I believe. Yeah, I'm sure if you look at the literature, you'll find that people have, without using a new term, I think I have to owe it to Ted Green for calling them that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's nothing new, really. <laughs> Don't give any more credit to Ted. He, get, he gets plenty enough credit. Um, so, uh, right. And, oh, it's another question from Paul, actually. But... Um, Paul saying, in the same way to how some forms of tree work are not suitable for spe certain species of trees, do you think it's likely that codit would occur differently between different species? Yes, I do. And uh, I mean, I think, in fact, if you look at all the literature that Alex Shiger and his co-workers and other people have done on codit, they have differentiated between tree species, particularly those which have a, a durable heartwood and those that don't. So the ones that don't, like uh, Fagus, for example, Aces, uh, you have to be more careful because if you expose large areas of this central wood, which is either non-durable hardwood or ripe wood, 
then you could be shortening the life of the tree quite seriously, either because it becomes un unstable or it, it actually even dies. So yes, there are, um, I think um, there's no problem between coded there and the old heart rot concept because the heart rot concept was all about not exposing too much of this older central wood. Um, I think what's really become more well known over the last sort of 40 years or so is that uh, it's the nature of that central wood that's really quite important. And if it's non-durable or it's a ripe wood which is non-durable, you need to be more careful. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Anne uh, from uh, Coventry Tree Wardens, hello Anne, has asked about Inonotus hispidus and ash. And uh, we, we've already talked about Maripolis on beach. And there's, of course, a lot of different specific fungi tree relationships that people are concerned about. And one of those is Inonotus hispidus and ash. What thoughts have you got on that? Is it, is it a, something that necessitates removal, do you think? Or can they live with it too? You see many examples in the countryside where it coexists pretty happily. It does cause some failure, mostly big branches falling off the stem where the, it's, the fungus is both in the main stem and a branch and branches tend to fall off sometimes. And if it's in some corner of a farmer's field, um, might injure the odd sheep maybe, but no one worries too much. If you saw it in a busy urban situation or in fact on a street situation yes it probably is a bit of a hazard and, but the fungus and the tree can live perfectly happily if you're not too worried about the ha hazard that might exist in the high usage area oh, by the way that uh, in another this is not confined to ash it's been found on other tree species as well but um, I think walnut uh, apple a few others there are very few decay fungi that are truly host specific. Yeah, absolutely. All about the context and where, where it is. Mm. Um, right. We've got so many questions now. I'm just trying to uh, find the, um, the, the sort of best ones we've got. Uh, Neil is asking about the ability of beach to outgrow Kretschmeria colonization. Uh, Neil says he always understood the fungi would would win, but he's since been told that actually the tree can respond enough. It's another one of those fungi tree combinations that uh, as arborists we're taught to fear, isn't it? Kretschmeria or Astulina yeah. formerly uh, and beech. What do you think about that? We've certainly seen some examples where trees seem to have coexisted with Kretschmeria for many years, but it does have quite a a reputation for causing either death of the tree or, or failure, mechanical failure of the tree. So again, I think there is no substitute for doing a proper assessment. Um, I did actually attend, even this was 10 years ago, uh, a demonstration, went over to um, Gothenburg in Sweden, and um, there was a demonstration of a device that uh, looks at um, functional root tissue by um, sonic it's a sonic analysis you're actually using a hammer a sonic device to look at connection between solid roots and the tree and we're looking at um uh, an aeschylus a horse chestnut that had crutchmeria um and it was decided that it should stay because it was in a high usage area near a, near a street corner but there was plenty of good solid connection between the tree root and the stem. So yes, it was a, a bit of a watching brief, but uh, whether that tree would have deteriorated quickly enough to become a hazard anytime soon, I don't know. So um, I would be pretty concerned about Kretschmeria generally. Um, and one thing I would look at is the top of the tree, because if that is showing signs of poor growth and sparseness, that is a sign the fungus is moving into living tissue and it may be winning the races against the tree's defences. If the top of the tree looks healthy, then I'd perhaps be a little bit more uh, happy that the, the, the tree growth is keeping pace and the fungus is not causing undue damage. But again, you need to look at the mechanical situation with 
instrumentation, at least tapping it with a hammer or do, do something to try and assess stability of the tree. There's no substitute for proper assessment. Mm -hmm. um, just condemning it because it's Crutchmeria probably is not necessary, but you need to be cautious if it's that particular fungus. Mm. I've actually got a question I'll, I'll ask my, uh, from, from me, not from the audience, but on that subject, that there's a woodland quite close to us here in Stonehouse where there's a lot of beech have been planted, some of them bundle planted, some of them sort of individually planted in, in the late 1800s. Almost all of the trees that have been bundle planted have got large amounts of Crutchmeria, sometimes up to about two metres. And I haven't seen it present in any of the uh, the sort of standalone trees. Is there something about the bundle planting, do you think, would encourage colonisation of Crutchmeria? That's a very interesting point. I hope you're going to write this up, John. <laughs> uh, I'll send you uh, the information and you can do it, Dan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you caught me on the hop there, but I can only, I can only guess that... Um, it's one of two things, one of which is there is, as you say, something about bundle planting. Maybe it just produces certain niches between the trees in the bundle that are good for Crutchmeria to initiate. But another possibility, and that is because you've got more than one tree, let's just suppose that Crutchmeria was latently present in the seedlings, uh, but putting it in a bundle, you've got several, several saplings put in there, there's more of a chance that Crutchmeria will already be there. So uh, another one for future research. I just saw something come up on the screen from Reg Harris about Crutchmeria. I don't that was another, it's gone off the screen now, but. Uh, just Reg has asked if it, oh, the, yeah. Reg asked a question about the coppice. Uh, that, so no, Reg, it's not a coppice. I'll do a presentation for you all about Dovro. I've just written a 15,000 word article that nobody asked for about this woodland. So I've been looking at it in detail. Not a coppice, bundle planted. Brilliant. See, this is the whole reason we do these webinars is that I can just get to ask David questions like that, but live in front of other people. It, it's fantastic. Um, you mentioned latent fungi and Hugo's got a good question about that. Hugo's asking, at what stage in the tree's life are latent fungi able to colonize a tree? Is it to do with the, the conditions, do you think, or is there an age aspect to, to uh, latent fungi as well? Oh, this is a really fascinating. I suspect there are a number of different ages and stages of growth. Um, there was some work done by someone called Ignacio Chapela, who was working with Lynn Body in Cardiff. It's a good few years ago now, more than a few. But he was looking at the first year's growth, just a young, non-lignified shoot. I think of hazel, uh, Corylus abalana. I'm going Latin name because I know we've got a lot of people from outside the UK. And um, you're looking at some of the, I think there's a fungus called uh, one of the hypoxium species, which we do find latently present in the sap. And he found if you put the spores on the surface, they, the, the germinating hyphae, the fungus, they go straight through the epidermis of the young shoot into the, well, you couldn't see quite where they were going. And he didn't have time to look in more detail, but it looks as though in some cases, the latent colonization is occurring in the, in the young shoot, just going straight through the, the, uh, the epidermis. It may be coming in through the foliage in another way. That, that, uh, we know that some pathogenic fungi can go from the foliage into the stem. And of course, that does happen with um, ash dieback fungus. So I'm sure it can happen also with some of these non-pathogenic mm -hmm. latent fungi that um, we find in the sapwood. So some really interesting work for someone there. Brilliant. And uh, Max has said in the chat that he very much appreciates using the Latin names, not the common names. And now he understands why we all had to learn all the Latin names. So absolutely, Max, that's quite right. And thank you, by the way, to all those of you who use the hands up icon uh, to show me that you can really see what I'm pointing to on my slides. That's really helpful. It's quite nice. Sometimes you get a sort of existential angst and not knowing if there's anyone out there. So it's actually quite nice seeing all the little mm. cartoon hands coming up. Oh, look, they're all doing it now. 
all right, you can stop now. It's not big and it's not clever. Um, okay, a question for, oh, here we go. Uh, yeah, 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 here we go. You're going to keep doing it. Uh, a question from Chris Knapman. Hello, Chris. Uh, Chris has said, it's been suggested that Latiaporus and other species of fungi have speciation. So they're different species or subspecies on different hosts. <laughs> Sorry, they're still sending those those cartoons up and I'm, they're distracting me. Um, for example, uh, it could differ on oak or yew to enable breakdown of different defense compounds. Is that mm. something that you found? Have you got an opinion on that? I have not looked into this, but uh, I mean, one little clue that you get with later porous sulfurias is that you see different morphology of the brackets when they're fruiting, which might indicate some genetic difference. It might even be that they're not the same species. So uh, again, it's something that could easily be done by DNA work to see are they separately enough even to be new species of later porous. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, when you see a fungus growing on both conifers and on broadleaves, which have different defensive compounds, my, I have the same suspicions as Chris does that they, they may be chemically so different, they're really different strains. But um, I honestly don't I don't recall seeing any specific work on this, but I don't keep up with all the literature now I'm an old man. So, <laughs> but it's certainly something that could be easily looked into. And I, I think it's quite likely they are at least strain differences, if not even species differences. Thank you. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a nice question from Simon, who's saying, as a young arborist plowing through the many books that have helped build the industry over the last few decades. What advice have you got to help Simon overcome the, the overwhelming feeling about this vast quantity of information and the fluidity of knowledge and the ever-changing facts? What advice have you got to a young arborist to, you know, how to stay on top of all of the wealth of information that's out there? Do you know, I think this is the first question this evening I think I don't know the answer to <laughs> at all. Um, I'm, I've fobbed a few off by saying it's for new research, but this one, I think the answer is there, but in the hands of someone who's actually done some much more work climbing trees than I, or, or cutting trees, someone who's really involved in the industry rather than uh, a researcher like myself. So I'm, I'm sorry, but I, it may be someone else in the audience can, can answer that better than I can. Well, I think uh, Paul has just said in the chat, come to the Wednesday webinars, which I, of course, think is very sound advice. But yeah, I think, Simon, it's just it is about meeting with your peers. It's about talking to other people in the industry. It's coming to events like this or to conference or different different things like that, sharing that knowledge and information. And uh, yeah, I guess trying to focus on what it is you're interested in, because you're never going to be able to read it all. You're never going to be able to learn it all. Find the stuff you're interested in and try and pursue that. There's always people out there who are going to be able to give you recommendations on books or webinars or whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, you're in a community of, of tree care professionals, a community of arboriculture. So uh, just reach out and chat to other people, I think. Yeah, the, the only thing I would say is that do look out for new myths where they're just replacing old myths. And, you know, uh, I'm not one of these evangelists. I suppose dear old Ted's more of an evangelist for ancient trees than I am. And I think Alex Shigo is a bit of an evangelist. Now, they have a very good role, important role to play. But sometimes you've got to be a bit careful when they're trying to say that everything that went before was a load of old rubbish. <laughs> um, and it, because sometimes a, a, an old myth can be replaced by a new myth. So uh, be a little bit, I say, be a bit skeptical about everything. So that's the only advice I could answer to that question. Brilliant. Sound advice, I think. Thank you, David. Right. We are very nearly at an end now, so we're going to do our final question. It always seems ridiculous to finish a webinar when there's more than 700 people watching, but uh, we, we have to do it. And we've got one final question that I know everybody wants to know the answer to, and that is, Dr. David Lonsdale, what is your favourite tree-related book? Well, we've already agreed I was never going to say it's any of my own books. <laughs> uh, this is it. 
and it's called, can you read that? It's called A Forest Journey. It's a bit shiny, maybe reflecting the light from my... No, head. that's okay, we can see that. So that's by John Perlin. And it it's not perhaps the book, but when I had to think about this question, I was forewarned, I thought I'm going to put that one up because it did change... It changed my thinking a bit because it's about trees and people, whether it was Europeans in the last few centuries or even earlier than that in other parts of the world and how people lived alongside trees, how they used and did the, indeed over exploited trees. And it is a really inspiring book. So that's the one I've chosen. That is absolutely brilliant. I hadn't heard of that book before, but I have written it down and will absolutely be getting it. So thank you uh, so much for that. David, I just want to say thank you so much. What an absolute pleasure that was. It was one of my favourite webinars that we've done. Just, just brilliant. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's one of the best things, happiest things I've done for a while. Thank you. Oh, it's, well, the, as you can see from they're all very click happy on their buttons. There's a lot of people very happy out there. Um, and it's it broke the record for the highest number of viewers we've had for any webinar as well. So uh, and, and well deserved too. thank you, David. Thank you, everybody out there for watching. Uh, thank you, Steele, our sponsors, of course, and for Andrew for helping behind the scenes. Please do look to join us next week, Ancient Trees and Planning, and then future weeks, Harry Studholm, uh, Jeremy Barrell, lots of stuff going on. So please have a look at the website. I will see you all next week. But uh, yeah, in the meantime, once again, Dr. David Lonsdale, thank you so much for a really wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.